Clashes between Nairobi University students and riot police in the 80s are legendary. Okay? People know that these battles used to be very vicious. Indeed, the students were not afraid of the police. It is said that the police were even more vicious because they would say, Oh, nyinyi dwale watu mnafikiri mmesoma, loosely translated, you're the people who think you're very learned. And they would really club at the students. But then the students were very sharp and smart. And many times they would outfox the police, uh, keep them in running battles during the whole day, yeah, until the government had no alternative but to shut down the Nairobi University. Now, legend has it that one day, Patrick Shaw, a reserve policeman, yeah, arrived at the University of Nairobi during one such riot. And uh, by the time his Volvo got to a certain spot, which was very bad, you know, there's a lot of fighting happening. By the time his Volvo car vehicle got there, and by the time he opened his door and stepped out, all the students involved in the chaos had, uh, were on their knees with their hands raised high in the air in surrender. This story has done the rounds for years. Is it true? Difficult to tell. But the truth is, Patrick Shaw was feared. Another story goes, and this one is verified, it is true, that thugs would hear that Patrick Shaw is looking for them, or that they're on the hit list of uh, this uh, Mzungu cop, very fat, uh, heavily built Mzungu cop, was uh, looking for them, they're on the, uh, this guy's hit list, and they would surrender themselves to the police. They would rush to the nearest police station and introduce themselves. I'm so and so, I'm being looked for by the police, especially Mr. Shaw. I surrender myself. <laughs> yeah, the guy was feared. And not without reason. The man was a sharpshooter. He never missed his target. Usually the head of uh, some thug. You would think that uh, such a heavily built uh, policeman six feet tall, 300 pounds, would be a very large target and easily to, uh, very easy to get. Yeah? Um, and therefore you would suspect or you would expect him to be gunned down very quickly by thugs. But it didn't happen. During his career or his reign on the streets of Nairobi over 40 years, Patrick Shaw never lost a gunfight with thugs, heavily armed thugs. Indeed, the only time he was shot was an incident whereby he rushed to the residence of a man where some thugs had broken in and were shooting people. Yeah? And uh, apparently he was not armed for some strange reason. On that day, he did not have any arms on him. Yeah? Any pistol or gun or anything like that. And as he got out of his vehicle, uh, he was shot in the shoulder. Now, Patrick Shaw got back into his vehicle and drove himself to Nairobi Hospital, where he received uh, medical attention. But he was very soon, very quickly, back in the streets, yeah, fighting crime in Nairobi. And it is such stories, such incidences, yeah, some even reported in the media, that build up the reputation of this man, such that people believed he was invincible. In fact, many Nairobians believed he was not a, a normal human being. They believed that he was some kind of uh, spirit super cop. <laughs> but who was this uh, Patrick David Shaw? Who was he really? Let us take a quick look yeah, at this man and uh, maybe at the end of this you'll be able to make your own decision <laughs> whether he was normal or not. I'm just half kidding. Anyway, Patrick Shaw came to Kenya in the year 1955. Yeah, This was uh, towards the tail end of the very bloody Mau Mau rebellion, which had been put down by the colonial government. But he did not come to Kenya as a security officer. He did not come to Kenya as a soldier or even a policeman. He came to Kenya as an agricultural officer yeah, to assist the white settler farmers uh, bear greater yield from their farms. Yeah, to do better in their farming activities. Now you can imagine after the horrors of the Mau Mau rebellion, because these uh, Mau Mau uh, people were actually beheading Mzugus whenever they got the opportunity, yeah, uh, killing uh, women and children. Yeah, 
Anyway, so you can imagine in the, during the horrors of the Mau Mau rebellion, uh, not very many white um, Zungus uh, wanted to live in Kenya. Even fewer, at least those who read newspapers, would uh, not have wanted to come to Kenya. But Patrick Shaw had a very adventurous spirit in him. So he came over to Kenya. Yeah? And uh, his intentions uh, and his motives for coming to Kenya uh, became very clear almost immediately. Because he landed in 1955, but by 1959, he was already a reserve police officer. Now, you can imagine because of the shortage of uh, Mzungus around, yeah, uh, the government, the colonial government at that time was short-handed most of the time. And therefore, anybody volunteering to be a reserve policeman, anybody volunteering for anything, was uh, very gladly and gratefully accepted. Now, back in England, uh, Patrick Shaw was actually the son of a doctor. Okay, and there's nothing in his background to suggest that he had any training in firearms before he came to Kenya. But the man was intelligent, a quick learner, and therefore it did not take a long time before he quickly asserted his authority in Nairobi, and an even shorter time before he became indispensable in the fight against crime in Nairobi and in keeping Nairobi safe. And mind you, this was shortly before independence, and he stayed on after independence. Now, there's a very uh, curious question uh, in Parliament in the mid-70s when uh, members of Parliament asked the government, yeah, at that, that time the person answering question, questions on behalf of the government was Assistant Minister John Keane, the late John Keane. John Keane was asked by members, how come this Muzungu cop always gets to trouble spots, yeah, always gets to crime spots? before our African, black African policemen get there? Obviously, obviously that was a very loaded question, uh, although very naive, because really what this uh, legislator was saying, he was saying there's some secret about fighting crime that the Mzungus have not yet passed uh, on to black African policemen. <laughs> now, this leads us to one of the secrets behind the big success of uh, Patrick Shaw. He was overweight grossly overweight and had been advised by doctors that uh, sleeping for long periods of time was a danger to his health in fact it was a danger to his life because uh, what would most likely happen would be a heart attack and so Patrick Shaw never slept on a bed in fact what he did he had uh, adjusted his Volvo vehicle so that the chair reclined back enough you know just at the right angle for him to lean back and catch a few uh, minutes sleep. Actually, he could not sleep for more than two hours uh, during any period of time or during any night. So while the rest of the mortals have uh, 16 hours of activity, <laughs> some will have their sleep even less, maybe eight hours of activity, this man, Patrick Shaw, had a whole 22 hours of activity in a day. Minimum of 22 hours of activity. And therefore, I mean, if you look, if you just work it out in terms of the hours and statistics, uh, for every one day a person lived, Patrick Shaw lived two days. <laughs> the man always carried uh, a radio call with him, and from colonial days, his code name was Romeo 9. Yeah, Romeo as in Romeo and Juliet. Now, it is not clear why he chose this particular name of uh, the radio, but he constantly had it on. He constantly had it on him. Even during his activities as Tare boys, because in later years, uh, in the, towards the 70s, sorry, uh, late 60s, he got a position at Tare Boys Center as the assistant administrator. And he was very well loved for, by the boys. I mean, if you attended his funeral, the boys really broke down, they were really hit very hard by his death. Because many of him considered uh, Shaw their father, their uncle, yeah? Because, you know, Stare Boys, especially in those days, was mainly uh, populated by orphans, people who did not have parents. And therefore, many of the boys at the school looked up to Patrick Shaw as a father. Anyway, he carried this radio call all over the place, even at the school, even when he slept. And therefore, it is not too difficult to figure out why, whenever anything happened in Nairobi, he would be the first on the scene. 
Many times he got to the scene of crime while the criminals were still there. And of course a shootout would ensue and always uh, Patrick Shaw came out on top. Yeah, dead thugs. And as his reputation grew, he landed on the hit list of uh, various criminals who wanted to have their way in the city. And uh, interestingly, none of those assassination attempts ever succeeded. And as the years rolled by, with assassination attempts failing, with people coming up with intricate plans which go nowhere, his reputation grew. Especially his reputation that this man was not a human being. He was some sort of spirit who could sense what criminals were planning, even if they were planning to kill him. Well, there's a logical non-spiritual explanation to the success of Patrick Shaw. Yeah. Now, when he arrived in Kenya uh, and joined the police reserve, uh, this was a very intelligent man. So he quickly learned quite a lot of things, became like a jack of all trades, even within the police. Now, the time Patrick Shaw joined the police, the most valued police officers were intelligence officers. And some of the intelligence officers sent to Kenya at the time, during the fight against Mamao, were some of the best in the world. Naturally, Patrick Shaw learned from them. Yeah? As a result, Patrick Shaw had a very intricate and very wide intelligence network. He even used parking boys. Yeah, you know the parking boys on the streets to give him information. Now in those days, we used to have something called a call box. And it was possible to make a reverse call, you know, without any money on one of these uh, call boxes. So we can imagine how he got information from these uh, parking boys scattered in every uh, corner and uh, part of Nairobi city. He even had his own uh, undercover informers within these criminal gangs. I mean, you can imagine the dreaded uh, Patrick Shaw uh, encounters you and he tells you, I'm going to spare your life as long as you go back to your gang and you give me all the information, what they're doing, what they're planning to do, etc., etc. And since in a period of 24 hours, the man only sleeps for a maximum of two hours, he has plenty of time to work his contacts and to find out what's happening. Indeed, his crime intelligence network was even much better it could not even be compared to the police one. And therefore, that is one clue right there uh, that explains why the many assassination attempts against Patrick Shaw failed. Yeah, He would get wind of them long before they even happened or even started to happen. Now, Stare Boys is treated uh, at the gateway of Eastlands. Yeah? And for decades and decades, the Eastlands area has been a grooming ground for some of the worst criminals in Nairobi. And Patrick Shaw seemed to know all of them, yeah? In one very amazing incident, where there was a fierce shootout between some thugs who had robbed a bank and the police, and of course uh, Shaw was there, uh, about six to seven gangsters were all shot dead at the end of that uh, drama. Patrick Shaw then proceeded to, to, uh, to walk towards the bodies, and then he identified each and every one of those bodies by name, first name and second name, Samuel Joroge, Tony Omondi, etc., etc. Indeed, Patrick Shaw fought crime many times without firing a single bullet. And the way he did it is that he walked up to somebody whom he knew he had already heard from his intelligence network that the person was involved in criminal activities. And therefore, there was no need to shoot them dead because he had no evidence that the person was involved in crime. But he had the credible intelligence that they were. So what he'd do, he'd walk up to the person and ask them to leave Nairobi for good. Or else, you know, if they didn't leave Nairobi, he would shoot them dead. It was as simple as that. And very many criminals <laughs> did not hesitate to obey Patrick Shaw. In one very interesting incident, he walked into the house of one of these budding criminals, actually his parents' house because the criminal was still staying with their parents, and uh, he walked straight through, ignoring the parents who were wondering, what's Patrick Shaw doing here? And went straight into the boy's bedroom and told the boy yeah, that uh, he had two options, only two. Either he stopped his uh, criminal ways or he left town never to return. And then as he was about to leave, he noticed, uh, you know, this is normal with the, <laughs> with the young boy's uh, rooms. There was a picture of a naked woman on the wall. 
So Patrick Shaw asked the boy, remove that, or rather ordered the boy. And this criminal hurriedly removed the poster <laughs> in his own room. That was Patrick Shaw for you. Now in my view, Patrick Shaw's great undoing was to get involved in politics. Multiple eyewitnesses reported that uh, one of the cars that had been following J.M. Karaoke for months before he was actually killed uh, was actually Patrick Shaw, meaning he was involved in the dirty work of the political police of the special branch at that time. And there are many other instances, like for instance during the, now this is a very interesting story, during the failed August, 19, August 1st 1982 coup, there was a police, there was a uh, Kenya Air Force officer called Ngatia. Yeah. Um, what had happened is that, uh, according to his intelligence network, Bwana Shaw had discovered that uh, Ngatia was, had been involved in a number of bank robberies. Now, of course, Shaw wanted to question him, and of course, protocol demanded that you don't, you don't just walk into a military base and arrest an officer. And sh so Shaw made a request uh, through the right, uh, the usual channels. Now, this was before the August 1st uh, coup. Now, one of the people that protected Ngatia was uh, the man who is on record as being in charge of the coup, Abwana Pancreas Ochuka. Now, according to information in a book written by a man called James Dianga, he has actually written the book 1982, The Attempted Coup, Ngatia was given the mission of arresting President Daniel Torekti Charap Moy after the successful coup. Yeah? And, but apart from Moi, he was also given the mission of making sure he kills Shaw before he goes to arrest Moi. Ngatia headed over to Stare Boys, but uh, when he reached Stare Boys, he realized that actually Shaw was not in the country. Actually, he was in Europe uh, visiting relatives. Shaw never went on holidays, but he used to do these uh, short, brief, one-week trips to catch up with his relatives in Europe. And of course, Ngatia never got to Moi, because that coup was not a success. Actually, in the middle of it, the K uh, Kenya Air Force officers were attacked by the Kenya Army and who were putting down the coup. Indeed, this is the same Ngatia who has a very popular political channel on YouTube. Anyway, uh, when Shaw heard that been, there had been a failed coup, he cut short his uh, trip to Europe and rushed back to Kenya and was very heavily involved in the interrogation of uh, the Kenya Air Force officers and those involved in the coup plot. Yeah? Therefore, Shaw was very heavily involved in politics as well. And those who believe that Shaw was, did not die a normal death, that actually was assassinated, there are those who believe that, although no evidence has ever been produced, those who believe that have good reason in the fact that the man was involved in politics. Now, Shaw died on February 15th, 1988. What happened is that he had dropped a former assistant uh, commissioner of police at their residence. And uh, the man just suddenly had a heart attack while he was in the residence of that uh, assistant commissioner of police. And what added fuel to the rumors that uh, actually this man did not die an ordinary death was the fact that his coffin was sealed. No viewing was allowed. Nobody actually viewed uh, Patrick Shaw's body before burial. And so people asking, what is this that's being hidden inside that coffin? Yeah, maybe a face with a bullet hole or something. Yeah, the rumors continued flying and they continue flying to this day. Now, although Patrick Shaw's methods were very unorthodox and indeed extrajudicial because he would kill uh, criminals without due process, okay, there are those who wish that in the current uh, Nairobi crime wave, Patrick Shaw would come back. Because the truth is, in the days of Patrick Shaw, <laughs> criminals feared. Indeed, there would never be a crime wave in Nairobi because even uh, criminals would just fear operating in Nairobi and would take their business elsewhere, even without encountering Patrick Shaw, just because of the man's reputation. Yeah. Patrick Shaw was a legendary super cop. Until next time, this is Chris Kumekucha.